we're in the very exciting field of uh, secured transactions and credit secured transactions and bankruptcy. Uh, this may or may not be a very long uh, lecture. I don't have a lot of slides here. I've got a pretty quick and dirty summary of bankruptcy. Um, but uh, what we're really looking at is if we issue debt, do we have a security interest in some good to uh, secure the debt to get repayment or incentivize repayment? Or is it unsecured debt? Your credit card is an unsecured debt. They don't have a hold on your car. The federal debt, the $20 trillion monster out there that I keep seeing is actually more like $130 trillion when you look at all the benefits we've promised to employees, uh, etc. This is an unsecured debt. It is guaranteed by the full faith and credit of the United States of America. Um, and so it's not like uh, the Japanese or the Chinese can come in and grab our aircraft carriers. Um, we don't operate in that fashion. They can't, can't come into the University of Missouri-St. Louis or St. Louis Community College and shut down the college. Now, those entities may have debt um, that would be secured. All right, so let's look at secured debt is the full faith and credit of the entity that is the corporation or the individual or the government entity. Um, plus, there's an actual asset, and that could be either physical, the car, the house, or it might even be a money or income stream. Um, keep going back to Shark Tank, but a lot of times Mr. Wonderful, Kevin O'Leary, likes uh, to give loans and say what I want is, I want um, a dollar off to every one of these products you sold on the internet till you've got my $200,000 back. Um, I'm going to get a secured interest. And so um, he's got a right to go enforce that in a court of law. He may even have the right to operate that business in order to gain the sales. Um, you know, if you go into default. So at the end, we look at default, and that's the reason we have either secured debt or unsecured debt. Um, and you'll see uh, secured debt's generally a little better. So if we're going to perfect a security interest, what we mean by this is tell, put the world on notice, put, tell other people, hey, I've given a loan to X, X has given me a title right in certain property they have. Uh, so if it's real estate, you know, standard item is a mortgage. Um, most states have a recording statute. Uh, so going way back to the uh, doomsday book uh, that the venerable Bede produced, um, it's kind of an example of an early recording statute. We're going to write down who owns all the property any liens that may be sitting against it. Um, in uh, most states, because real estate can't be picked up and moved, the buildings can, the hot water heaters can, but the land itself is going to stay there. It's a state matter. Um, and almost every state has, well, I don't know of any exceptions, has a recording statute. Um, and usually there's a recorder of deeds at the county level. Um, Sometimes we may be able to, uh, oh, I was like, what is deficiency judgment? I want to caution people who think I'm going to get a loan. It's going to be secured by my home, and I'll be done if I default on it. They'll just uh, sell my house, and that's the end of it. Well, the problem with a lot of mortgages is, and particularly modern issue mortgages, is that we may not have enough uh, value left in the home uh, or in the property by the time it uh, goes to be sold. You know, these are these slides were prepared about six uh, years after the big credit crisis where we saw a whole bunch, uh, I think it was three to four percent of all real estate uh, was in foreclosure. Normal number is about half that. 
um, you know, one and a half percent is is considered relatively high foreclosure rate. Um, and uh, you know what happened was there was so much foreclosed property out there. We actually had trouble attracting buyers. Another problem we had was a fair number of people thought, oh, you know, I've defaulted on this. I'm going to I'm going to take everything out of here. I'm going to take the sinks out. I'm going to take the copper plumbing out. Um, I'm going to let my dogs uh, live in here. Or of course, we may even the place may have become a flop house. It may have had uh, homeless folks who moved in. Um, but we've seen some just destroyed properties. Look good on the outside, but you open the door. Um, and ooh, it's nasty. And if you don't believe me, you can look at some of Tarek and Christina's flipper flop uh, early videos. They are showing some right after uh, crisis videos, and some of those homes are in deplorable shape. So that you know, I'd say it's got a two hundred forty thousand dollar loan. We may only be able to get one hundred twenty grand for the property. Well, that means you owe the other hundred twenty thousand. And there's a deficiency judgment that may attach to you. It may even sit there and attach on the land so that anybody coming in to buy, um, you know, may have to pay off this loan, which, you know, um, or you're going to get it on you personally. Um, anyway, that gets a little bit into the weeds. Uh, obviously, Tarek and Christina are not going to pay that full two hundred forty thousand dollars on a property they think they can only flip for four hundred grand after they put two hundred grand into it. They've got a total of three hundred twenty grand um, that they've invested, and so the profit they're not going to give that away for anybody. You know, their their reason to make it better is to. Uh, move it, and so the states have an interest in let's keep the property moving. A bank, you made a bad loan, go after the people you made the bad loan to. Don't tie up the property that much. Uh, it varies by state to state. Um, personal property, all right. Revised Article 9, 2001 at Sequitur. This has been passed. This is part of the UCC that all states have passed. <coughs> Article 2, they weren't so quick on, and so it's still hanging out there. And there are other parts of the UCC that have not been uniformly passed. But revised, revised Article 9, which talks about secured transactions, that's there. All right. Um, a security agreement um, is debtor is not in possession. Um, that may be that the debtor doesn't own it. Um, another entity we get is a floating lien. Um, you know, one of the problems we may get to with a business is that uh, we give them a line of credit. They're able to access it for 10, 15, 20 years, and they're in and out. And, you know, sometimes it's got 5000 on it, and sometimes it's got 200000 on it, and in and out, and in and out. Well, you know, what we've got is security interest maybe in their trucks, their backhoes, their tools, um, you know, some of their bigger items. Uh, well, the problem is those backhoes get moved in and out, um, you know, and so what we may want is a floating lien, an after acquired uh, uh, property. Um, we may actually want a floating lien on any sale you make. We get a check off of your proceeds, or we've got the right to, if you're behind, to take your proceeds. Um, and, uh, you know, we may, with this floating lien, the ability to go there, we may be able to advance you more money, uh, too. So, you know, you'll see a lot of businesses have this kind of floating lien concept. Um, you know, debt is not your friend ordinarily. We've come to a point in America where, where they've sort of told us, oh, no, you have to have debt in order to survive. Um, you know, my wife paid off our house a long time ago, and... Uh, you know, we're going into retirement. We don't. We're not still paying on our house. Um, you know, there are people who, uh, 15 years out, still have their student loans. Uh, you know, that's crushing. 
debt is crushing neither a borrower nor a lender B. Not to say we can't do this. We have to have debt, probably. Uh, I mean, we did finance our first home, and luckily we stayed within our means um, and didn't buy something that gave us, you know, that we were at 40% of income going to a debt. Um, that's where a lot of this credit crisis stuff came in, is that they keep amp ramping up how much you can take a loan on. Let me digress a little bit longer on, uh, it used to be in real estate that you could not get a loan unless you actually put down 20%. And what was really happening there, if you peel the bark back, was that um, it's sort of like a car. You buy a new car, as soon as you drive it off the lot, it's depreciated by at least 10%, maybe 20%. Same thing is very true in real estate. You buy a $200,000 car, or $200,000 home, um, if the bank has to sell it as the bank, it may only be worth 160 grand. Well, if they only loaned you 160,000, they've got a pretty high likelihood of getting 98% or more of their percent of their money back. If they loan you the full value, it really better be worth more than that. You've got to be in a rising market. And that what triggered the whole thing was the, the credit crisis was everybody thought, oh, property prices just advance. They just advance 5% every year. That's just how it is. Well, all of that stuff ends at some point in time. And periodically, the value of things actually declines. Um, you know, it's not like uh, a car. They decline with use. Uh, you know, there are rare cars that increase, but not with use. Uh, you know, homes, because we live in them and we spill stuff in them and everything else, um, you know, they don't hold this high value. I, I kind of look around my house and I'm like, ooh, we got to clean this up. So <laughs> for when we sell it, it's a lot of work. Anyway, let's look at the backing up. So, you know, what we what we look at is as you're loaning, you know, I don't want to look at you guys to think of this only as, um, oh, how do I get a loan? Hopefully you'll be in the business where maybe you're putting the money out there so people can acquire things. Um, and, uh, you know, credit cards, you can see 18% interest rates. Oh, that's crushing. Well, a lot of that is because... Uh, we've got default rates associated with this because it's unsecured credit. As we're going to see when we get to bankruptcy, there's a lot of people who don't pay this. All right. Um, as we're looking at personal property, one of the things we can do is um, uh, file a financing statement that we can periodically update or we can say we've got a right to um, we've got a right to uh, after acquired property you know but what we have to do is we're putting it on notice to people um, and so sometimes we see these at the Secretary of State level as well as the county uh, uh, level um, Debtor in possession, we're ordinarily going to want to file on this. They've got it, uh, but we're going to take it. Um, there are certain consumer goods um, where uh, we do get a purchase money security interest in consumer goods. Uh, I believe this relates to uh, credit card debt. Um, My primary experience with this is that, you know, if we put it on a credit card, which is kind of a revolving credit, um, to the extent this purchases consumer goods, we as creditor, in case of default, you know, it's kind of a last deal, um, may have the right to go back and grab that good. Uh, you know, that's an Article 9 transaction. This is, at least for me, pretty far in the weeds in terms of where that stands. Um, you know, but if we're loaning to people, we have to look at what other credit cards do you have. Be careful because, you know, they 
we may not be able to take all of the personal property of these people after back, b bankruptcy exception. Some of that property may belong to uh, a creditor, um, you know, and so the creditors can pick and choose. But you know, a washer and dryer potentially has some value even in a resale market. So um, let's jump to where to file because we have to perfect a security interest uh, in order for it to have priority against other creditors, both secured and unsecured. You know, it's potential that uh, I go to buy a car um, and I get four banks to loan me purchase price on it. Guess who gets there? Whoever gets there first, according to state law, has the priority interest. So, you know, we see this periodically in people who are in um, uh, pretty deep financial straits. They'll go get, they'll be negotiating with three different banks and they'll get a check from each of them. And the first one to get their security interest filed is the one who has the security interest priority. Um, and that usually means they're the only one who gets the property because as we've talked about, anytime we're selling in a default, we're lucky to get 80 cents on the dollar. 40 cents on the dollar in consumer goods or other goods is much more the norm. You know, think about it. If you've got a used car, um, who's going to buy it quickly? Who's going to get you the money quickly? Somebody who probably thinks they can flip it. You know, they're going to be able to make a profit on it. Well, if it's really worth 80% of original sale value, in order for me to buy it, I'm only going to pay 40% because that then gives me marketing costs and storage costs and transportation costs, plus maybe a 20% profit if I can sell it at that full 80% valuation. Um, in terms of filing, this always varies by state, and I caution you too, sometimes by county. Uh, Missouri appears to have gone to a much more local or a statewide Secretary of State security interest filing. Um, but you may want to look at dotting I's, crossing T's, particularly in the more populous counties like the city of St. Louis, uh, Jackson County over in Kansas City, uh, maybe around Springfield. Um, you know, as you're doing this stuff, you may want to do belt and suspenders, I guess is what I'm trying to say, is that we put not only statewide buyers uh, on notice, we also put local buyers or local creditors. And so some of them are handled by the recorder of deeds, oddly, even with personal property. Um, others, it's a clerk. And sometimes there's a registrar, you know, that's a matter that, that each state would know. Um, it's usually the county clerk, but not always. So, you know, uh, use of caution there. Think about it. Um, all right, so here's the big deal. Secured creditors trump unsecured creditors in terms of that asset. Uh, first, to perfect the interest insecured wins you know so if uh, someone is silly enough to loan me a million dollars for my fabulous SIU Carbondale uh, mug um, and someone else does the same thing and the first one to the courthouse is kinda who wins the first one to the county uh, building and gets it on file wins now we've gone to more electronic filing um, so that some of you know some of the moving the paper doesn't matter that much. We got accurate time and date stamps. Um, you know, my my knowledge of this stuff is back before the internet. <laughs> internet was just coming around. I mean, I, I took classes at the early internet at the University of Illinois. I think they called it the Plato system, which is which was an intranet that later became the internet um, you know so all of this digital stuff we're used to now you know take a picture of, of your check with your phone and then deposit it right to your bank um, this is just really new to me so uh, you know 
but I've noticed on the sites where we can do this, that sort of uh, um, perfection systems are already in play. You know, we may be able to take a picture of the security transaction on our phone and send it directly to the uh, county clerk. Um, here's something that's kind of interesting, and this is a UCC deal. The buyer in the ordinary course of business gets a sound title. <coughs> um, now, should that buyer have checked? Uh, yes, if you've already got a security interest in here, um, it's they bought it what we might call cumonere with the burden. It's burdened by that security interest. Um, but if it is an unsecured asset, the creditors cannot attach the asset. Um, you know, so uh, I guess the warning to creditors is make sure it's listed. Uh, you know, but the buyer in the ordinary course of business um, has priority right on that property. And I think what we're thinking there is it's better to keep these goods in use rather than to have them tied up in default proceedings. Um, generally, if a creditor or a debtor goes into default, uh, we have the right of possession um, uh, or re repossession. We can uh, keep the item if that's what was going on. Um, again, we've got this deficiency judgment. If the car doesn't sell for that, we're still going to have a personal judgment entered against the debtor. Um, a lot of this stuff is e-secured transactions. A lot, a lot, a lot is on the internet. So, um, you know, maybe as I'm dictating this, I'm 15 years behind the times. <laughs> uh, so let's look at surety and guarantee arrangements. And some of you probably have some awareness of this. You may have, uh, you know, you turn 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, uh, well, 17, and you got a job and you needed a car. Your family wanted you to build up a credit relationship. And so, you know, they they cut a deal to get you a $1,000 car and, and uh um, you know, maybe you got a $500 loan on it. Um, well, because you were a minor, you couldn't enter into a contract. So what we may have is your parents signed. All right. Now, a, there's kind of two ways here. There's an accommodation party. I sign um, in order to get this transaction going through, um, but I'm not really taking on any of the debt. Um, you know, and so it, it may be that, you know, I'm just doing this, um, and the UCC is very clear on what an accommodation party is. Um, the banking people know this better than I do. Uh, let me pause. I'll go. Not to, it's just, I'm sorry. I thought I had a clear mind on this, but, um, you know, it's just somebody who's there to hold it. They may or may not really, we may not be able to get a judgment against that individual. Um, oops, didn't want to do that. Sorry. Um, cosigner. If I cosign the note on behalf of my minor sign, I have become primarily liable. Um, even as that son goes into majority, I still owe it. Um, if I'm the guarantor, I'm secondarily liable. I only have to pay if the primary debtor defaults. Now, in any um, credit transaction, there is the availability of bankruptcy. And bankruptcy is a federal matter. It is Article 1, Section 8, Clause 4. It is a federal power. And if we look at it, it is under either the Supremacy Clause or if we want to look at Amendment 10, it's a power given to the federal government. Therefore, it's not given to the state. Um, you know, the uh, Article 4 or 5 or 6, I can't remember where Supremacy Clause is. I always have to look it up. I think it's 6. Um, federal law is 
is uh, supreme. And if we think about this, it makes some sense. Um, we used to have states of receivership and everything else, and they were all run by the states. <coughs> it was a pretty ununiform system, and it tended to favor state occupants over non-state. It, it had some real problems. Given all the problems that we may or may not have with uh, uh, bankruptcy, we do have uh, a somewhat uniform system. The major exception is that the exemptions in bankruptcy on items that can be seized and sold, the kind of debtor's estate items that are free from being uh, satisfied out of the estate, um, is a state matter. Uh, under federal law. Um, but generally, bankruptcy law is pretty uniform across the United States. We don't have the Ninth Circuit doing crazy stuff on bankruptcy law or the Fourth Circuit doing, you know, we don't have the big federal courts uh, doing stuff. And we have a division of federal courts that just does bankruptcy. So those judges, pretty much that's all they ever do is bankruptcy. Um, you know, and so they become pretty expert at it. Uh, quick and dirty review of this. Chapter 7, liquidation. The business is going out. We're selling it. We're done. Uh, as soon as we're done, we're out of here. Um, we see this with both individuals. We're going to get a complete discharge and businesses. Um, that is, if you loaned money or have a credit interest with this individual, you must file a claim. You maybe have to prove it. Um, you'll get whatever comes from the sale. Everything goes over to a trustee in bankruptcy, and the trustee in bankruptcy is the one who sells all the assets and leads the creditors meetings and um, makes sure that uh, uh, each person is treated accordingly, that you filed your security interest, that it is perfected. It is a place where if you haven't perfected your security interest, you may lose your security interest. Um, you know, but ultimately, Chapter 7 liquidation, we're going to get a complete and final discharge of any debt that was entered into up to the date of filing. Um, usually new debt cannot be issued with that individual, they can't go out and get new debt. But the moment they're discharged, my goodness, they can go run it up again. And so a lot of credit card companies kind of sit there and monitor who's coming out of bankruptcy. Oh, good. Well, let's loan them some money. And the deal is that ordinarily, even people who went through bankruptcy, at least for a year or two, are pretty good. So, you know, if you know what you're doing, you can make good money off of them because you can charge them the highly usurious rates of your state. You know, well, you just filed bankruptcy, so your credit card's 28%. Ooh. You know, so that, anyway, you get the folks into a kind of a cycle. Well, what we get to ultimately is that you cannot file bankruptcy, at least on the liquidation phase, um, more frequently than every seven years. Now, reorganization, you can do that more often. And TWA is an example of that. Um, the details of that, I, I don't know perfectly. Um, you know, but if we look at the American bankruptcy system compared to what uh, Charles Dickens described in Little Dorrit and other places, um, it's better than debtor's prison. I mean, debtor's prison was the idea that, okay, now you move over here, you live there, and X amount of your paycheck always comes back to the people you owe money to. Somewhat similar to reorganization under Chapter 11 or uh, Chapter 13, Individual Debt Adjustment, which is the individual section of this. Um, <laughs> what we're doing in reorganization... This is a corporate matter, and um, oftentimes we're going to go in, and, and what I've seen in reorganization, a lot of times they get this negotiated in advance. What kind of a haircut am I going to take on the debt I loan to this business in order maybe to have new debt coming out that's going to be paid? I'd rather that TWA, if they're going to, if they've lost the money, 
maybe I'll take the haircut based upon the idea that I might have a business that I rescue that now gives me 20 uh, years of uh, good revenue stream. Um, a lot of times these reorganizations at least seem to me like they've been worked out in advance because they'll be done in and out inside of four months. They've got all, everybody in line. They've met all the creditors have all come together. They've decided this is what we're going to do. Um, I'm going to skip farmers and family fishermen. Um, you know, certainly if we were out county, uh, this is a big deal. What happens in Chapter 12? If you're dealing with family farmers, you know, uh, and I don't know whether this encompasses corporate farmers as well. I don't believe so. This is designed for smaller entities, but I'd have to check this, and I don't know. Um, you know, this is where you might be. Uh, it, very different and significant carve-outs, something you need to do. The individual debt adjustment is ordinarily referred to as the wage earner plan, i.e. I have a job, I can afford to pay back this. So what they may do is affirm certain debts. That's also something they can do in a liquidation. I'm going to affirm that I'm going to pay this debt off. You know, we can get a private agreement coming out of liquidation that as I come out, I actually still owe that old debt. Um, you know, and that's my discharge would be I'm going to discharge every debt except these five that I agree I'm going to pay back. Um, the wage earner plan is a little tighter uh, circle. Um, it has certain entities that can be given preference, uh, others that cannot. Um, one of the big things in bankruptcy is the automatic stay. I've got to quit if I'm a creditor bugging the debtor, why aren't you paying me? The moment I call him, all the debtor has to say is, I filed bankruptcy on this claim. You need to file um, uh, with my lawyer. Here's my lawyer information. Please don't call again. If that creditor calls again, the bankruptcy trustee and the court are usually pretty tough on creditors who do not honor the automatic stay. They think, oh, okay, you think federal law is just some little plaything? No, let us teach you a lesson. And they will. So, you know, if you are tempted to push the envelope on the automatic stay, don't. Um, as I said, the discharge, that ends the debt. You cannot come back later and go, oh, you know, that old debt you had, uh, we'd like to reestablish your good credit, but we need you to pay this old debt off. No, you're in violation of federal bankruptcy law. Don't go there. Um, and... Um, Let's look at claims priority, and I've got a little note to self here. Mention look back power. One of the features of uh, bankruptcy law is that the trustee has some power to look back as much as three years, definitely as much as a year, on any transaction that was done kind of before the bankruptcy happened, and they may be able to wipe out that debt by going, no, this was, you should have known, walking in, this person's on the edge, and you can't get yourself ahead of every other creditor who had loaned this person money by coming in later and securing all these interests. We're going to wipe out all your security interests. Yeah, you did it fine, but the problem was, if you had done it with enough research, you would have recognized this guy's up to his eyeballs in debt and really can't uh, pay this back. And the fact that I'm coming in late and getting a security interest, um, I'm probably not going to get that. The trustee in bankruptcy is going to look back at this and void those transactions. Um, you know, that that's a little bit in the weeds, but the trustee has a lot of power. So let's look at claims priority. <coughs> Then guess what? The trustee in bankruptcy gets paid out of the assets. Top, top, top. Um, the attorney for the bankrupt, also in there. Taxes, any federal or state taxes, that's first. Then we go to secured creditors. Then we begin to look at, and secured creditors get the property they've got security on. Um, the balance of it makes up the bankrupt estate. So anything that's not secured, we're going to drag off 
uh, somewhere else. So, you know, if we're going through bankruptcy, the home in bankruptcy is secured. Um, unsecured creditors. I want to mention to you that if your business goes belly up, you are generally an unsecured creditor of that business. And my experience is secured creditors get about 40 cents on the dollar. Unsecured creditors get about a dime on the dollar. That is the real value. You know, you take all all the phones or whatever that the uh, employer owns, and you know we're probably going to put them in a big lot. And you know this is uh, maybe a five hundred dollar phone, but in a used condition in a bankruptcy, we're going to get maybe forty bucks on each of them. Um, you know that's less than. 10%. We're not going to get full value on this thing. And in part because we're going to wipe it all clean. Uh, we don't know where it's been. We don't know how damaged it may be. You know, we may buy 40 phones, but only 28 of them are really worthwhile. The other 12 are junk. So we got to factor that in as we're buying. Um, other unsecured creditors, general obligation bonds. Okay, so this is for our finance majors because I teach finance classes, and here's my plug. I teach retirement planning. I think it's a great class. I also teach insurance, uh, principles of insurance, and that's uh, um, you know, pretty cool stuff. But uh, my pitch is bonds are only slightly ahead of stock. A fair amount of time, the bondholders get nothing just like the stockholders. Um, and so for my money, I'd rather own the stock because if the company's making money and not going bankrupt, I get a better return generally on stock than I do on bonds. Not always. Very true. Um, I have included in uh, this website uh, the lawcornell.edu slash uh, link. So maybe I should go there. Um, and uh, let's see what we get. Um, and that's your listing of priorities. And you can see it's pretty long. All right. So there's your priority listing. And what you need to do is look at 11 U.S. Code, Section 507. And that tells you who gets what and in what order. So... Uh, bottom line, of course, then, is be a secured creditor. Better deal in bankruptcy, but be careful when you're loaning. You know, you cannot jump a whole bunch of loans uh, just because this person maybe gives you a security interest. doesn't mean it's that good a deal. You've got to do your homework on everybody. I believe this is my last slide, so I'm going to say goodbye, and that's what it is. Au revoir.